And welcome, everyone. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Vicki Mayo today to the program. She's very kindly agreed to join us, a senior lecturer in reproductive immunology based on the Department of Metabolism, Digestion, and Reproduction at the Imperial College of London. Got her PhD at University of Cambridge on NK cells in human pregnancy in 2015. And she was awarded a Sir Henry Dale Fellowship. We will talk. You can follow her on Twitter at v Vicky Loves F A C S. I believe that's and it's V I K I. So she very kindly agreed to uh, present her material to us, which I'm delighted to listen to. We'll get right to it after this. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And uh, everybody, we are watching you out on the restream. And of course, we are out on Twitter spaces as well. Uh, I see people piling in right now. We'll hopefully have a chance to get some questions in here at some point. And of course, the Rumble Rants will be watching you there as well. So as I said, uh, Dr. Mayle is a PhD in reproductive immunology. And she had some really interesting Twitter threads out there. If you want to see her position, she spells it out very nicely and clearly. Let's go ahead and welcome to the program, Dr. Mayle. Hey there. Hi, good evening. Nice to be here. Thank you for staying up for this. I appreciate it. We we invite people all the time who, uh, for reasons that are unclear to me, refuse to come in. But uh, I think just conversation amongst peers is so important. And collegiality and modeling, how science is done through communicative exchange and didacticism. I, I, I don't see any <laughs> downside to that myself. So thank you for being a part of it. Um, as always, for me, uh, people have grave misconceptions about who I am or what I represent. And always uh, people, whatever people say about me is what comes through. So let me uh, sort of tell you where I'm starting for this conversation is, um, you know, my dad was a family practitioner uh, for 50 years, I practice general medicine for 40 years. And so do no harm is a major sort of uh, ethical uh, preoccupation I have. And so before I engage in any sort of medical interventions, I like to be very clear on the risk reward of what's going on. In my in my uh, practice, all of my patients are uh, age 65 and above are fully boosted and, uh, and with the bivalent, they're just there, that's it, period. And uh, in fact, I was so grateful recently when I had a complicated tuberculosis patient who had had near liver failure from one of the anti-tuberculous meds, was on five meds, got COVID. I couldn't use the Paxlovid because of the interaction causing further hep hepatotoxicity. I was so grateful that my patient had been vaxxed and boosted and uh, by both the full series and the bivalent booster. So it, in elderly patients, there's no doubt in my mind about the risk reward benefit. Now, because I have a nuanced uh, opinion on vaccine, I get blasted from both sides, of course. Uh, so, so, and I saw you taking on some heat today and I, I, it's a lot of fun, isn't it? When people start attacking you for your position, even though it isn't re really representing your position. M my, my question, I wanna get right the risk reward in younger populations. I'm, I'm a little confused about it. I want you to help me out with that. Sound like a place to start or would you like to start somewhere else? Yeah, I would be uh, really happy to start there. My area of expertise is COVID vaccination in fertility, pregnancy, and a little bit breastfeeding. So how about we start by talking about what can happen if you get COVID when you're pregnant? Mm, let's start one step before that. We do need to get into that. Um, we have a, because I think this would be a way into it. I don't know if you saw the CDC just an hour ago released data on pregnancy in the United States, that we are at all time highs for complications of pregnancy. And the, the increase that has been steady over the last three years does not mention COVID. It mentions cardiovascular disease and particularly pulmonary emboli. And one of my questions is if pulmonary embolus is on the on the upswing, 
Could that be something related to post-COVID phenomenon? Could it be something post-COVID plus vaccine? Uh, what, what is this where suddenly pulmonary embolus is killing pregnant women? That's a really interesting question. And I'm afraid I haven't seen that data that the CDC has released, so I can't really comment on that. We do, of course, know that um, COVID is um, quite often, particularly when it's bad, and particularly in pregnancy, you know, um, a problem of clotting. And we do also know that there can be uh, long-term effects, particularly uh, in the heart of COVID, even when the acute disease is over. So I'm not gonna say that you're wrong there, but I'm afraid I haven't seen that data from the CDC this evening. Um, uh, I, over, yeah, I will just read what it says. I'll, I'll read it to you. It says, uh, cardiovascular conditions, pulmonary embolism, uncontrolled bleeding, and problems from hypertension are leading cause of pregnancy-related death. Does not mention COVID anywhere. Um, some pregnancy complications several. It's interesting right. that they should mention hypertension because that is actually one of the things that we know that COVID increases the risk of in pregnancy. So you probably know that um, preeclampsia is hypertensive disorder in pregnancy, and we know that COVID increases the risk that you will get preeclampsia in pregnancy, not by loads, but by enough that we can spot it. 1.6 times. Um, and while we're talking about what COVID does in pregnancy, we know that it increases the risk that your baby will be born um, preterm by about one and a half times, uh, that your baby will be stillborn by about two and a half times, uh, and that your baby will die when they're a newborn by about three and a half times. So it's possible that COVID is playing into these things that the CDC um, have mentioned there. I feel like probably if they really thought that COVID was a major causative factor, they would have mentioned that. But I think that is a really good starting point for our discussion to talk about all these terrible things that COVID can do to your baby when you're pregnant. And also, it's not great for you. It increases the risk that you're going to need intensive care. Um, and these are, um, when we're talking about risks and benefits of vaccination, um, these are the benefits of vaccination. It reduces these risks um, of preterm birth, stillbirth, and you needing intensive care. What are the actual numbers on the stillbirth? So I don't know yours in America, but I can give you ours um, from Britain. So between um, March of 2020 and October 2021, we have 77 on the record COVID pregnancy losses, of which 59 are stillbirths. So, you know, um, some of those are miscarriages, what we would call miscarriages, they're slightly earlier in um, pregnancy losses. And um, the reason that these pregnancy losses can be put down to COVID is because a condition called SARS-CoV-2 placentitis was identified and was um, very strongly linked by someone called uh, David, I think his first name is Schwartz, through a case series of um, 68 stillbirths where the mother had COVID and they took a look at the placenta and they could see that the placenta had this very particular pathology. One of the things was that it was uh, infected with the COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, another is that you can see the placenta dying. So the cells in the placenta are dying. And you can also see um, immune cells called macrophages coming in in between uh, the villi of the placenta. So where it should be mum's blood flowing freely, there's inflammation. And there's also fibrosis, so like scarring. And these are the three characteristics of SARS-CoV-2 placentitis. And about 50% of the time that this happens, um, according to the first case studies, this is when you'll get a stillbirth. So I want to be really clear. I don't want to panic anyone. You know, stillbirth is quite rare. It's about um, half a percent of pregnancies usually, or even a little bit less. So even if you have, you know, three times the chance of stillbirth, that's only, you know, one and a half percent or two percent chance of stillbirth if you're getting COVID. But still, you know, to me, 77 pregnancy losses over the course of 18 months that we could have prevented here in the UK. And you've got 10 times more people than us. So I'm going to say you're probably in the ballpark of 700, 800 uh, over the course of the yeah. year. I, I, think we, I think if we can prevent those, we should. I, I'm again, uh, it, provided that by intervening, we're not somehow causing something on the other side. I'm, I'm looking at the mortality data. Maternal death rates increased from 23.8 per 100,000 in 2020 to 32.9, 89% increase since 2018, uh, either during or within 42 days of the end of their pregnancy. Huh. Now, now in the in the 59 stillbirths, you said there were spontaneous abortions in that group. They weren't all 
full term deliveries born still, which is what I consider a stillbirth? So no, there were 77 pregnancy losses, of which 59 were stillbirths. So uh, let's take 59 away from 77. Uh, so what have we got? We've got um, 22 uh, miscarriages were included in those statistics. Okay. Uh, so from less, it's so weird that would be less, because spontaneous abortions are so common. Oh, right. And what was what was this? And, and what was the statistical analysis they used to establish that that was an adequate uh, n in this in this study to actually say? I understand you're saying there's one and a quarter or whatever increase in silver, but is that is that statistic? I know it's n not good, but is it statistically significant that they do some sort of statistical statistical analysis to say that this was relevant? Yeah. Sure. So those are just our raw numbers from the UK. The figure that I give you of um, it's actually exactly 2.36 times the uh, odds ratio of having a stillbirth if you have COVID compared to if you don't have COVID. Uh, it comes from a systematic review by, oh, I can't now remember if it's John Allity's systematic review in the BMJ or Greg Marchand's, which is in the American Journal of Obs and Gynecol, uh, but one of those. And what they've done is they've looked at all the uh, risks uh, the outcomes that you get in pregnancy when people catch COVID. And they've done what's called a, a systematic review to, in an unbiased way, find all of the literature on that. And then a what's called a meta-analysis, which is to kind of combine the literature together so that instead of having maybe 10 or 20 small studies, you kind of do a bit of statistics to make it more like it's one big study. And then they've said, is that, yes, yeah, statistically significant? And the answer is that all of those things that I've just told you, um, they are statistically significant increases over what would happen if you didn't have, have COVID. Um, I won't be mentioning any risks that are statistically no different because if the risk's no different, we don't necessarily need to talk about it. And of course, meta-analyses get criticized for a million reasons. The the only, and this is, was not a Cochrane study, which is the one that people usually point at as the, the sort of the gold standard of meta-analysis. We're talking about a different study from the one that you were talking about with the 77 and 59 stillbirths. So, and there are no RCTs, right? We have nothing going forward, or do we? Um, about safety and pregnancy? Well, um, we do have some data from RCTs. So uh, it was uh, in the clinical trials, the participants were asked not to become pregnant, which is really standard way of running a clinical trial. And we can talk about um, why that is a little bit later and actually whether that is how we should run clinical trials. But people were asked not to become pregnant. But these were big trials, right? Really big trials with um, you know 15,000 people in each arm in some of the mRNA vaccine trials and accidents happen. And so, of course, in a big trial where accidents happen at a low rate, you will see some pregnancies, even though people were told not to become pregnant. And the one that I think um, that you were showing for that tweet was the Pfizer trial, but the exact same thing uh, is true of the trials of the Moderna vaccine. And also um, for you in America, I think you've approved J&J. &J. For us here in the UK, we have not J&J, &J, but AstraZeneca. All of these had some level of accidental pregnancies that happened. And uh, in the Pfizer trial, in the control group, there were 47 pregnancies that happened by accident, uh, seven of which led ultimately to pregnancy loss. So 15% of the pregnancies in the control group, so the people who weren't vaccinated, um, had pregnancy loss. And in the vaccinated group, there were 44, uh, sorry, there were 42 pregnancies and three miscarriages. So that's a 7% miscarriage rate. So, so straight away, some people might get excited about that and say, hey, um, we know, and I haven't gone on to talking about this yet, but we know the vaccine prevents uh, people who get vaccinated are less likely to have a stillbirth. Oh, wow, hey, are people who get vaccinated also less likely to have a miscarriage? But I want to be really clear here that even though the miscarriage rate is lower in the vaccine group in the trials than it is in the control group, these differences are mm -hmm. not statistically significantly different from each other, and they're also mm -hmm. not different from normal. So this is the Pfizer okay. trial, which I've gone into in a little bit of detail because that's the tweet you showed. But we have really similar data from the Moderna trial, from the J&J &J trial, uh, and from the AstraZeneca trial. They all had some amount of accidental pregnancies, the outcomes of which were all um, in the range of normal. And uh, I think you actually e emailed us that study. I really appreciate your taking the time to do that. That was very much appreciated. And I, I, I read that oh, one. No worries. Um, it's, um, I think it's hard to have a discussion if we don't 
tell each other in advance, you know, what the evidence is that we're going yeah. to be talking about. So it's absolutely, you know, a pleasure to have done that. Yeah, it's very kind. And, and I, again, I'm just trying to get to the get to a, you know a level of comfort with these things because as i said it's it's so when you're dealing with elderly population it, it's so clear the benefits i mean you really can it's obvious uh, but clinically it's a lot harder in younger people having seen a ton of vaccine injury and when you see you know you, when you render healthy people sick with your medical intervention it it catches your attention it's not something you feel particularly good about and so, you know, you see a few of those and you start scratching your head about what are we actually doing, especially now I'm not talking about the pregnancy now, but in say younger males who are having lots of problems. Um, the COVID itself is of no significance to them, really. I mean, almost nothing. And um, you just, you wonder, you just start asking questions. So um, uh, what about, this is the other area I'm having a question in my own mind with. Um, Everybody's had COVID, right? Uh, and in all probability, let's just let's just posit that the immunity from the vaccine and COVID is equivalent, just for the sake of conversation. Um, everyone's had COVID. Why expose somebody, assuming that they've had, uh, you know, let's say they had COVID six months ago? Why add another medical intervention to that patient since their risk of COVID is so low? Yeah, I think you're um, asking a good question there about how we determine the vaccine schedule. And um, I guess I would ask you to think about um, how we vaccinate against flu uh, and particularly how we vaccinate against flu in pregnancy, because everyone's had flu and a lot of people have had flu vaccine in the past. So why do we recommend that when you're pregnant, you get a booster against flu? And the answer for that really is that immunity wanes over time. And we certainly know this for COVID and we actually know it for COVID uh, infection and we also know it for COVID vaccination. So there's some point at which your protection gets you know, low enough that you might be at risk of some of those bad effects of COVID that we've talked about, particularly in pregnancy. And the logic, um, certainly to our policy here in the UK, which is that if you're pregnant, you'll be offered a booster in the autumn, as long as it's more than three months since your last COVID infection, um, is effectively just that. But we think that if it's been longer than three months since your last uh, infection, your immunity is waning enough that you're potentially at risk of these um, dangerous things happening. And the logic is the same for the flu vaccine, which we also offer in pregnancy as a booster in the autumn. Now, your policy. Care uh, careful, America careful. There's a little there's a little bit of a false comparison there, because what I'm saying, what if somebody had flu? three months before their pregnancy, would you give them a booster during pregnancy? If they had COVID three months before the pregnancy, would you give them a booster? Well, our national guidance in the UK would be to do so, and your national guidance in the USA would to, to be take to the do flu, so. To well. take the flu, to take a flu booster, even though you had flu three months ago. So for flu, I didn't actually look up your national guidance in the USA. Maybe you can tell me what your national guidance in the USA is. No, no, no. Is. But but I'm saying, is that your guidance in the UK? I want to make sure I'm getting it. That's all. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not yeah. challenging. I just want to make sure I'm getting it. So because yeah, I, I thought I heard you say, I thought I heard you say if, if you had the vaccine this year, you still got a booster during pregnancy for flu. Well, for, yeah, if you know, if you had, we only offer the flu um, during what we call the autumn, which starts in roughly speaking October and finishes confusingly yeah. in roughly speaking February. So you you wouldn't yeah. really have the opportunity to have had it that soon, if you see what I mean under under the way that we do it here. No, no I think we're we're not hearing each other. So so if you had flu, let's say if you, you get influenza A and you get pregnant three months later, what you told me is you take a flu vaccine anyway, even though you just had flu. That's the recommendation. What, what, I'm, recommendation. what I'm also at, okay. And what I'm also asking is if I had the flu vaccine in November and I get pregnant in February, are they also recommending a booster for the vaccine? That's a, that's a really interesting question. I don't actually know if you had, say, um, a flu vaccine in November because you're, say, a healthcare worker and you became pregnant in, say, January. Right. Would you have right. enough right. food? I think not. And I'll tell you why. It's because it's called the autumn boost. And they'd say, have you had your autumn boost? Right. And you would say, yes, I have. Right. But, but okay. let's think but, about but, it. But, 
I think the question I that you're really getting at here yeah, go ahead. is you're saying, okay, um, under these circumstances, the benefit of getting a boost is smaller, right? That's your that's your logic. And at some point, the benefit of getting I, a I'm, boost I'm wondering, I, I, I'm, cl- I'm, not, I'm not quite... I'm not quite. Um, it's not quite that clear in my head yet, <laughs> frankly. It's just, I, it, it's the, it's, it's. Here's, here's really what's in my head, which is everybody's had COVID, period, end of story, and all the data is sort of pre-natural immunity vaccine alone, and so I'm wondering what COVID plus vaccine does. I, I'm wondering what that is because we have no data on that really. Um, do you mean in terms of protection? No, I'm sure the I, I've seen some of the protection data in terms of it, it's a little bit better, uh, but I, but I mean in terms of uh, da- well, how much of an upside benefit and how much of added risk is there because we don't have the data, we just don't have it, and so it, that's really everybody now. Everybody's had COVID and everyone's getting the vaccine. What is happening in that situation? Can we say something about that yet? So yeah, go ahead. We can actually. Okay, so let, let's ahead. talk about the data. And let's kind of, um, before we talk about uh, the studies that have come out really recently looking at boosters in populations who have already lived through the pandemic, who have already had you know, their primary course, let's just start right out and talk about the major safety data that we've got, because it's something that we really need to address when we're talking about risks and benefits, and we haven't got to it yet. So um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which is our equivalent here, and, you know, 119 other um, public health bodies around the world, they recommend that you get um, vaccinated against COVID when you're pregnant or a boost. And what data are they making that recommendation on? And I think it's really important that we understand this. So, um, yes, we've talked about the clinical trial data, but that's kind of limited. You know, not that many people got pregnant in the clinical trials. What we really need is more data. And uh, America has actually been amazing at this. So um, well done. And uh, Israel has also been amazing uh, because America and Israel, you know, they took the view very early that, okay, we have this clinical trial data. It's not not a lot, but we know that COVID is bad in pregnancy. Let's offer the vaccine to people. They're um, adults, they're old enough to consent and make up their own minds. And um, we will track them really, really carefully to see what's going on. And it was really noticeable to me, because obviously I've got a lot of colleagues who are obstetricians and gynecologists, and some of them are in the States, that all of my, and I've got a lot of colleagues who are pregnant just because the age that I am, um, all of them who were pregnant were really, really keen to go out and get the vaccine because they had seen these COVID stillbirths and these COVID preterm births, and they didn't want that for their own baby. But what America did amazingly was collect data from these people through BeSafe and also through um, the vaccine safety data link. And by February of 2021, we had the first data there, which was from just under 4,000 people who had signed up for BeSafe um, and among whom the pregnancy outcomes looked normal. And that's exactly the data that we used uh, in the UK later on in April to say, okay, we've been holding off. We have wanted more data before we felt comfortable um, offering the vaccine in pregnancy. But now we have this really nice data from the United States and we're starting to get really nice data from Israel. And this is what we'll use to make our recommendations. Um, And the data has just kept coming in. And we now have, to my knowledge, uh, 36 studies from nine different countries um, and that include more than 360,000 people vaccinated in pregnancy. And they've looked at all of the outcomes you would hope that they would look at. So is there an increased risk of miscarriage if you get vaccinated and you're pregnant? No, there's not. Is there an increased risk of preterm birth? No. Uh, Is there an increased risk of stillbirth? No. And in fact, as I've mentioned, there's some evidence from meta-analyses that there's a decreased risk of stillbirth among people who get vaccinated. And that kind of makes sense if we think about the fact that we know that COVID can can cause you to have a stillbirth. Um, Although, you know, there are some statistical things that we can maybe talk about in addition with that 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 might be important to mention. Is there an increased risk that your baby will be smaller than they would be expected to be? No. Is there an increased risk of preeclampsia? No. Uh, is there an increased risk of congenital abnormalities? That's something that people would often worry about. No. And some of these studies have followed babies up until they're six months old. Um, and all of these babies are looking just like lovely, normal babies at six months old. So we have this wealth of data about um, the vaccines when they're first given, you know, doses one and two, that tell us that there's absolutely um, no increased risk of any pregnancy problems. And as I've said, a potentially decreased risk uh, of COVID stillbirth. 
And one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about COVID stillbirth is that there's been a really lovely review um, of all the cases of COVID stillbirth. Uh, that was published in January of this year um, by Schwartz, who's the person who discovered COVID stillbirth or, or really found the mechanism. And there have actually been no cases of COVID stillbirth uh, among people who are vaccinated, which supports you know, that data showing that vaccination does reduce the risk of stillbirth. OK, so this is where we are. You know, This is where we make the recommendation, have dose one, have dose two, get yourself protected, don't have these problems um, that COVID can cause during pregnancy. But we've kept collecting the safety data. Of course we have, because this is such an important point. Um, and we've moved on to collecting safety data about boosters in populations who have already had their primary course, in populations who have already had COVID. And all of these um, studies on the safety of boosters show that they're exactly the same as um, the first set of doses. There's no increased risk of any of these pregnancy problems that we would really like to avoid, like miscarriage, preterm birth and stillbirth even um, when we're looking at data on boosters, not just on the primary course. It seems odd to me this the, when, when I see data, again, that doesn't sort of fit my clinical experience, I, I worry about it. And, and the, the fact that there's no documentation of any vaccine injury or vaccine, post-vaccine symptomatology in pregnant women was very odd. It, it just doesn't fit. It's just anybody that's done hundreds of vaccines will see things. Um, and that all, that all I, made me call it into question. You know, what, what's, I, I, you know what I mean? And by the way, you sent me the V-safe data too, and I really appreciate that as well. Uh, and, but, you know, I, I, it just doesn't, when, it, when things don't fit my clinical experience, I just, I, I just, it, it gets, it gets difficult for me. If, if they were saying, well, you know, we saw a certain number of vaccine injuries, but it didn't affect the, the birth or it didn't affect the pregnancy or, you know, I, that I would understand that I get, but I didn't see anything like that. Is that somewhere? So, um, let's start by saying that it's not completely true that there are no cases in the literature of, uh, any vaccine injuries, because I do know of at least one, um, with, I think it was the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Janssen vaccine. It was one of the adenovirus vectored vaccines being used down in Brazil. And there was a case of what's called um, vaccine induced um, <laughs> thrombocytic thrombocytopenia. It was TTP, TTP. And, yeah, uh, uh, and that's, that. that was why. And that was why it was so pulled was, from the market. And, you know, it happened, it happened in pregnancy. Correct. That's my point. It happened in pregnancy and it happened. Right. And I actually had some of the symptomatology of that because I took the Janssen vaccine and I woke up with raccoon's eyes and the symptoms of a transverse sinus thrombosis, which was really awesome. And that's caused by a TTP like conceptive coagulopathy. Yeah. So, and so, um, so I'm not surprised. The, not so, oh, there's my eye. Not surprised <laughs> that uh, happened with AstraZeneca, but, but, um, but I'm, but there's, tons of other vaccine reactions going on uh, that people are seeing clinically. They're not, we, it's hard to tell how common because the data is just, people are arguing about the data all the time, but there are things that happen. And the fact that none of that is happening in pregnant women, just, I don't know, it just stands out to me. That's all. The The other question so, I have well, is, are there other vaccines? Let's talk about vaccines? that because that's actually, that's uh, that cause that's actually something that people okay. quite commonly ask me. They say, um, okay, I feel really reassured by the data that we've properly collected um, to do with, you know, is there any harm to the baby or the pregnancy? And I feel reassured that there's loads of that. Um, but what are the possibilities of other side effects that aren't to do with my pregnancy? And we've already discussed how there's um, one case in the literature of um, what I would call VIT down in um, Brazil. Um, and that had quite a bad outcome, actually, largely because the person didn't receive the proper treatment. Um, and as you say, we wouldn't recommend that vaccine in, pe in young people now for exactly that reason. The, uh, the thing that we do recommend in pregnancy, the vaccines that we prefer to use because we have the most safety data on them, are the mRNA vaccines. Um, but as you probably know, there is one potential quite severe side effect that can happen with the mRNA vaccines, and that's myocarditis. And that happens most commonly in young males. So you can straight away start to see why there's a reduced risk of that happening if you're a female, and also maybe even a further reduced risk of it happening if you're pregnant. But nonetheless, there has been um, specific surveillance for this, and there have been two really big and thorough reviews published, um, one in the American Journal of Obs and Gynae, 
and one in the Journal of the American College of Cardiologists, um, both in August of uh, last year, saying, let's review the literature and be really sure that we haven't missed any reported cases of vaccine-induced myocarditis happening in pregnancy. And um, both of these reviews couldn't find anything, which of course isn't to say that there isn't anything because maybe it hasn't been reported in the literature, but certainly it's not been common enough to be reported in the literature. And actually I got in touch with the first author of the review in um, the American Journal of Obs and Gynae. And I said, hey, you published this safety review in August. And I just wanted to check with you because I know you keep up with this, it's part of your job. Um, has there been anything since then? And he said, no. But it is important to know that actually in the official recommendations, both from um, the American um, Journal of Obs and Gynae and from the American College of Cardiologists, they say, well, you know, Although we've never seen it happening, it is a possibility and we do need to be alert to it. So if you've got a pregnant patient and they're five days post vaccination, or now it would probably be five days post boost, and they're getting um, you know, uh, chest pain, uh, pressure, shortness of breath, sort of palpitations, it's definitely something that you should suspect and that you should treat in the same way that you would normally treat it. So I just want to be really clear that you know, there are probably reasons yeah. that this is much rarer among yeah. pregnant people than it is among, well, you know, young males where we usually see it. Could well be. And it's not that we're not looking for. We are looking for it. We just yeah. haven't seen any yet. I, I actually wasn't thinking about myocarditis because I've yet to see that in a female. I, I was thinking more about this kind of myasthenia that people get where they're incredibly weak and short of breath and can't walk. And I mean, maybe it's hard to distinguish that from some of the third trimester pregnancy symptoms. I, I don't know. But um, but I just, there was none of that in the... So, so you know, it's, just, say, it's, it's um, all transient. Yeah. It's transient. And to be fair, it's transient. And if it saves a baby on one side and you get some misery on with the short term, I think most people would take that short term mis misery, no problem. But I didn't, I just that it didn't show up was what seemed odd to me. So VSAFE did specifically uh, ask people to report on um, myalgia, fatigue and weakness. And there were some reports of that. Um, in fact, going yeah. up to, you know, a, a decently um, large amount, kind of in the 10% a week, they might say, yeah, but, you know, they were still perfectly able to get up and about, or they might say, no, I felt so achy and weak that I was in bed for three days. But, but it's not that those things yeah. weren't looked for and weren't reported on. They have, however, been kind of lumped in together with people who felt achy, felt and, weak, and, uh, but again, were able to go about you're, their business. You're I, I get you. And you're, you're really kind of lumping in the sort of acute vaccine response on discomfort. I'm talking about something that goes on for six months where people can't walk across the room. This is this I've seen a, quite a bit of this. In fact, I'm going to interview a friend of mine that had this and it's, you know, he's a robust, you know, writer producer all of a sudden, you know, couldn't really was life was taken away from him for a year. And, and this you, if you give the vaccine out, you see this, you just do. And again, it doesn't they don't die. At least there are cases that where people claim there are deaths but the ones I've seen have just been disabling. And the fact that, anyway, because there were such big, the big numbers you were describing, I was like, hey, there's got to be people in there that have these reactions. But anyway, let's, let's leave that behind that we can't solve that. Um, the Let's talk about menstrual irregularities for a second. So let me explain to you why I was apologizing to Naomi Wolf. I was apologizing to Naomi, Naomi Wolf because I was very dismissive of her report of menstrual irregularities after the vaccine. And I said exactly... What's that, Susan? Seven months ago. It was seven months ago. It was seven months ago that she, she came in and said so. And I went, the, the, women's menstrual periods get affected by everything. It, it doesn't mean anything. Stop it. Don't, don't look there. That, that doesn't mean anything to me. Then uh, I saw reports from Pfizer and multiple other sources saying that there are significant menstrual irregularities, that uh, there was some data also that generally side effects from the vaccine were worse in women. I'm, I'll get that data for you in a second. It was kind of weird. Um, uh, here it is. Uh, 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 sorry. No, I didn't. It seems like I didn't copy it. Um, nope, don't have it. But anyway, there, there's some, some report of uh, worsening side effects in females. But um, my what what got me is I this is unpublished data I've seen from a pathologist showing spike protein without nucleocapsid, in other words, pure spike protein, meaning vaccine-produced spike protein, in hypothalamus, in ovaries, in 
the lining of the uterus associated with a certain coagulopathy that could add to excess bleeding. And I thought, wow, uh, it's being widely reported and there's some possible mechanisms here. I owe her an apology for being so dismissive. So that was the reason for the apology was that I was, I was I very am, dismissive of it. I am pleased that you apologized for, you know, dismissing people's reports of their own experiences of their bodies. And um, you probably know, because you invited me on here, but maybe your viewers don't, that one of the things um, that I was involved in quite early in the pandemic was saying, hey, I think we should listen to people's reports. Not necessarily that we should just believe people's reports, because you're right, menstrual cycles do vary a lot. And one of the things that we've really found out in investigating this properly, and I've been one of the people who've been involved in investigating this properly, um, is quite how much menstrual cycles vary, because the background level of variation is just enormous. Um, and yeah, some people said at the time, uh, you know, hey, Vicky, you're wasting your time doing this research. It will just turn out to be background variation. Um, and then some other people were also very angry that I was doing the research. They were like, hey, why do you need to do the research? Um, you know, don't you believe me when you say that my period was later or heavier or, or whatever it was? Um, and of course, I do believe them. But the question is, is that caused by the vaccine or is that something that would have happened anyway? And we now have really, really good data that addresses this. And I think it's um, a good idea to go into this now because it's not something that you um, discussed last time you were talking to Naomi. Maybe it's not something um, that she knows about. But um, one of the really strong ways of approaching this has been to use menstrual cycle app tracking data. And um, the reason for that is because if we ask people about their experience after the vaccine, uh, they'll tell us their experience. Maybe they a little bit misremember it because it was a bit in the past, or maybe they tell us completely accurately. But what also tends to happen is that the people who have something really weird happen tend to really want to tell us about it. And the people who didn't have anything particular happen are not so bothered to take part. So menstrual cycle app tracking data is really great because people are just tracking the menstrual cycles anyway. They always do as a way of keeping on top of their health. It's a good idea. Um, and we can use that data with their permission to say, OK, here's your data that you've logged anyway. Can you please tell us what day you were vaccinated? And then we can look at what, say, three cycles for them on average looked before they got vaccinated. And we can say, is the cycle after you got vaccinated different? And crucially, we can also compare them to people who didn't get vaccinated. So we've got a control group. And when we do that, what we find is that on average, getting vaccinated does increase the length of your cycle by about half a day or a day, depending on which study, because a whole bunch of studies have been done looking at this. But crucially, uh, and, and the people actually who really, really saw a big difference, some people did, um, was if you managed to get both doses of the vaccine, dose one and dose two, in the same cycle, you saw a bigger difference. It was more like uh, a little bit over three days, somewhere between three and three and a half days. So that's quite a noticeable difference, actually, for a lot of people. But really importantly, um, the differences in cycle length went back to normal um, for people who had one dose in the cycle, the following cycle, or for people who had two doses in the cycle, the cycle after that. So we're back to, back to our normal cycle um, length. And then we also looked at things like menstrual flow, which is obviously a little bit more to do with your subjective feelings. And that one was really interesting because what we found was that about 34% of people who weren't vaccinated, so this is our control group, this just tells us what's happening ordinarily, in um, a particular cycle will say, oh yeah, that cycle was, uh, my period was heavier than usual. But 38% of people, and that is statistically more, significantly more, um, who have been vaccinated will say, oh yeah, my period was a little bit heavier than normal. So we do also have evidence from these same approaches that the period after you're vaccinated uh, will be, well, in, in about 4% of people due to the vaccine will be heavier than normal. But again, this goes back to normal, the next cycle. And this is really, really important for lots of reasons. First of all, it means that, you know, if you get vaccinated and you notice um, a small change to your cycle, a bit later than usual, a bit heavier than usual, that's not necessarily cause for concern. Although, to be fair, usually if you just have one cycle that's a little bit weird, that's not cause for concern. Uh, but it, it could be due to the vaccine. But if you notice a change um, that persists, the evidence suggests that that's not due to the vaccine. And that's something that you should go and you should talk to your do doctor and you should get checked out to find out what's going on and to get it treated. Because what we would really hate is for people who had, you know, something that was treatable 
that should be checked out to think that it was a vaccine effect when it was not. So these are the two really important um, kind of clinical points that come up from this. But sort of philosophically, I think another really important point is that it is important to listen to people's experiences of their own bodies, to use that to guide our research questions, um, and yeah, to, to take people's reports seriously. So although I thought Naomi misrepresented a lot of stuff last week and failed to mention a lot of stuff, I do think you were actually, um, you know, I think it was fair that you apologised to her for dismissing this as something that wasn't important because it is important. And, and I do try to let my guests present their data as they understand it. Um, to this, um, I, I'm not sure I quite understood why if you have persistent menstrual irregularities, you can necessarily rule out a vaccine effect, but I totally agree with you that you get an evaluation to make sure that there's not uh, uh, some other cause, which is certainly likely. Yeah, well, I think an important thing to say uh, about these studies that have done, been done with menstrual cycle tracking apps is the study design is really strong and I think once you put all the studies together, you've got something like 20,000 people in there. So you're right that, you know, when you're only looking at 20,000 people, if you've got something that happens, you know, one in every 100,000 times, you're not going to detect that. So, uh, okay. you know, as always with science, I put my hand on my heart and I say, well, we can't see it in 20,000 people, but maybe it happens one in 100,000 times. But if it does yeah. happen, it's certainly really, really, really rare. So rare, we haven't been able to detect it when we've been looking really hard for it. And your and your study did parse things out a little more, but I did find the the Pfizer data. This is in a uh, cumulative analysis of post authorization adverse event reports, appendix two point one cumulative number of case reports, serious and non serious, medically confirmed and non medically confirmed. So again, we're going to left with the same questions, but it shows substantially greater numbers of adverse events in women contrasted with men. The signal is particularly strong for the reproductive organs and their functions. Women have approximately three times the risk of adverse events than males, and the specific risk to the reproductive organs and their function is even stronger than that three times. So yeah, something, I, I and again, it might, and it, but let me just say, it could be just that one cycle, right? That would qualify for that data that comes under that appendix. I, I think it's really important to talk about how that data is collected, um, because that's what's called spontaneous reporting. And um, it's really important that we collect data from spontaneous reporting because it's amazing at spotting. It's not really VAERS. Rare... This isn't VAERS. This isn't VAERS. This is this is the Kaiser post analysis, cumulative analysis of post authorization adverse events by Pfizer. This is their yes, follow up on their on their. Yeah, okay. I'm just making sure we got the same thing. Okay. No, no. I, I know. And actually, if you if you dig into that report a little bit, you'll see that some of that data does come from VAERS. Some of that data comes from um, our, our version of VAERS in the UK, which is Yellow Card. Some of that data comes from UDRA Vigilance. So you're right, it's not VAERS. And some of it has actually been reported directly to Pfizer. Um, you did have the option to report directly to Pfizer, um, certainly in the UK and probably also in the US, although what they tried to do was if you reported to say yellow card and Pfizer, they would try to make sure that, um, you know, didn't turn up twice in their report. But it's all um, spontaneous reporting, whether it's to VAERS, whether it's to yellow card, whether it's to UTRA vigilance, or whether people have reported it directly to Pfizer. And so it works the same way, which is really that, you know, you get vaccinated and after you're vaccinated, you say, oh, well, you know, I, I've noticed this. Let's say I've noticed I've had a heavier than usual period. Um, and you don't necessarily right. have to think that that happened because of the vaccine, but you you can report it anyway. And right. um it's, it's a really, really great way of finding very severe things that never happen when you're not vaccinated, but do happen when you're vaccinated, even if they're really rare. And this is exactly how we found uh, VIPT with the AstraZeneca vaccine, and it's exactly how you in the USA noticed vaccine-associated myocarditis. So it really works for certain classes of things. It's not so good, though, for things that happen really commonly um, and might increase in their rate. So a really good example of this is a heavier than normal period. That will happen normally about, uh, you know, 30 something percent of the time. And so if everyone were reporting, it would be absolutely flooded with reports of heavier than normal periods because that's going to happen to about 30 something percent of people. And one thing that's really important um, to realize as well is that reporting is affected by how much people are talking about things. And so we had a period um, in both the UK and in the USA, circa about May uh, of 2021, April or May of 2021, 
when a lot of people were talking about this, you know, oh, does getting vaccinated cause you to have a slightly different period than usual? And as a result of this, and I absolutely said to people, you know, if you've had a different period from usual and um, it's in the month after you got vaccinated, yeah, report it to Yellow Card. Like, we won't, you know, there won't be enough evidence to investigate it properly unless these things get reported. Um, and so people like me encouraging people to report cause people to report. And so a lot of those reports will be just because of increased awareness and increased reporting rather than because um, all of those are vaccine associated events. Lots of them are just things that happened after vaccination. And that's why it was important to do these proper formal studies to really nail it down. And again, I'm going to give big credit to you in the USA because in about May, when these reports started to come in, um, the National Institutes of Health Research were like, hmm, um, yeah, we definitely need to investigate this. And they put something like $1.6 million aside and funded five studies into it. And, and some of these studies are the ones that I've just been reporting. So, you know, although a lot of people were dismissive of this, um, the US government, they kind of put their money where their mouth was and they saw a signal and they investigated it. And, and now we know what that signal was. And, and as I was saying before, it, it, it's not inconsistent with what you reported in terms of the study you just parsed out with the increased flow abnormal period for one month the the three times adverse events in females may include a large population which are just reporting exactly what you said in your study right which is that they had a abnormal a abnormal period that went back to normal that would still get reported as an adverse event yeah absolutely so it could be the exact it could be it could be just a different way of reporting exactly what you were talking about a few minutes ago uh, so, uh, what, what would you like to go over next? I have to take a little break here, but I'm wondering if we, we could maybe take some calls or we could talk about fertility. Um, I'm not sure where to, what, what's on your, what, what do you think we've missed? Well, do you know what? We've talked about pregnancy. We've talked about the menstrual cycle. I think it would be really natural to talk about fertility. Um, there's a lot of evidence around okay. this and it's also something that people okay. are quite often worried about. So let's talk about that okay. when we come back. All right. All right. All right. We'll do that. Take a little break. Be right back. I think you know how much Susan and I love our Genucel skincare and how easy it is to try our one of a kind customer packages bundled with our favorite products. Susan realized the other day that one of our kids stole some of our deep correcting serum from our stash, if you will. We had no idea that the lactic and hyaluronic acid combo is so great for adult acne, dark marks, and scars so not only are susan and i hooked on these products but apparently somebody else in our family is too somebody's ripping it off i know i'm a snob about the products i use on my face everybody knows it every time i go to the dermatologist's office they're just rows and rows of different creams retinols vitamin c cream under eye cream night creams scrubs and then when i get to the counter they're overpriced all kinds of products that you can all find at genucel.com i've fallen in love with this product at a fraction of the price. I've been using Genucel for six months now, and I'm very impressed. Great skincare is important at any age, and we love how amazing the results are. Thank you to Genucel. Plus, now you can find your very own bundle based on your unique skincare needs. Using cutting edge AI skincare technology, you can get a full skin analysis instantly and create a skincare regimen tailored towards your needs. Visit genucel.com slash Drew to check out our favorites and enter that promo code Drew, D-R-E-W, at checkout for added savings. All orders include free shipping and a free mineral mask. Order now. Go to genucel.com slash Drew. That is genucel, G-E-N-U-C-E-L, genucel.com slash Drew. Buy gold and get a free save to store it in. You heard right. On qualifying purchases from Birch Gold Group now through March 31st, they will ship you a free safe directly to your door. Here's the deal. The Fed keeps raising rates because it is the only tool they have to keep inflation under control. But it isn't working. You can't spend your way out of inflation. And you've seen the impact on the stock market. You've seen the impact on your savings. Hedge inflation by owning gold. Whether physical gold and silver in your safe or through an IRA in precious metals where you can hold real gold and silver in tax-sheltered retirement accounts. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers. Visit birchgold.com slash Drew for your free info kit on gold and to claim eligibility for your free home safe 
by March 31st on qualifying purchases. Again, visit B-I-R-C-H gold, birchgold.com slash D-R-E-W. All right, we are back. Our guest is Dr. Vicki Mail. Let's bring Dr. Mail in here. Uh, and we are going to talk a little bit about fertility. I, it's, if the, let me just, before we launch into it, I was just thinking before we started, before I, we got to know each other, that if the menstrual irregularities were more substantial than the studies suggested, which kind of has been my clinical experience, the, the, my experience has been that, again, it could be from something else, it could be improperly, you know, I, I get it. That, but, you know, a, a study is not necessarily thus saith the Lord. Believe me, I, like I said, I've got 90 years of medical practice between my dad and myself bearing down on me. And it's I've seen standards of care be wrong more times than I care to count. And, and then one of the things that raises my concern is when my clinical experience doesn't fit it. And I would say, I, uh, in addition to the nasty sort of neurasthenia from the vaccine, I've seen a lot of six months of menstrual irregularities of either amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, just changes in their in their in their significant changes in their menstrual flow. That does restore; it does go back to normal. But if that's true, or if that's any reflection of reality, again. If it's from the vaccine and if my clinical experience is a reflection of reality, it's hard to imagine how that couldn't affect fertility, at least in the short term, right? It would have to. Okay, let's jump in right there because we do have a study that yeah. um, actually addresses that directly from um, someone called yeah. Amelia Westlink, which was published last year in the um, American Journal of Epidemiology. Um, so the first thing to say, of course, is that, you know, let's say that this that our studies of 20,000 odd people are true and um, menstrual changes are delay of you know half a day or a day um even the most enthusiastic ttcers um as we would call them in my line of work people who are trying for a baby um will not be timing their intercourse down to the half day so a half day change in the timing of the menstrual cycle i, I mean if anyone is timing their intercourse down to the half day please call in i would love to hear from you right. um would um anyone who's who's um having that kind of change to their menstrual cycle we wouldn't expect it to affect um, conception because the fertile window is is three days usually. Um, but a specific study by Amelia Westlink has been done to look into this. And what she was doing was she was tracking um, a little over 2000 couples who were trying to conceive um, through intercourse. And we can talk a bit later about the studies that have been done in IVF settings because there are lots of them. Um, and she found that even in the month that you get vaccinated, that doesn't reduce the chance that you conceive. And that's kind of in line with what I've just said that we would expect. This is a super important study, though, because um, it looked at both the male and the female partners, um, vaccination and infection. And vaccination didn't reduce the chance that the couple would conceive, whether it was the male or the female partner. And actually, infection didn't reduce the chance that um, the couple would conceive if it was in the female partner. But infection did reduce the chance that the couple would conceive um, if that was the male partner that got infected. And it reduced the chance that they would conceive for about two months. And this is actually in line with lots and lots of studies um, that we've done looking at what happens to sperm when you get COVID. And getting COVID makes your sperm, um, it lowers the count and it lowers the quality. So it's kind of not surprising that it temporarily reduces your fertility. But I want to be really, really clear. I don't want anyone who gets COVID to a panic. Um, it's a temporary reduction in fertility. So, um, you know, don't panic. But I, I'm sure any severe viral doesn't. There's got to be other data on other severe viral illnesses that look about the same, right? I mean, it sounds sort of axiomatic. Yeah, well, I mean, the absolute classic, and we stray slightly out of my area of expertise here as we start to talk about the testicles, but, you know, it's 11 o'clock here, so why not? Um, <laughs> mumps is the absolute classic, um, causes orchitis, and that orchitis causes yeah. um, temporary reduction in fertility and can actually potentially cause... Um, a longer term reduction in fertility. Permanent. So yes, you're absolutely Permanent. right. Um, COVID isn't the only yeah. thing that can reduce male fertility, but yeah. it's kind of important, yeah. I guess, for, for, for people to know if they're trying to conceive um, that this might be a possibility and that if it's really important to them to conceive quickly, they might want to avoid catching COVID. Um, but okay, yeah, so that's Amelia Westlink talking about female fertility specifically in couples who are trying to conceive through intercourse and showing that it doesn't reduce even in the month you get vaccinated and it doesn't reduce in the months. Um, she did nine months of follow up, so it doesn't reduce in the, the following. How about IVF? Um, I'm, yeah. I'm guessing there's so a lot of data there. 
we have a lot of data from IVF settings. Um, and that's kind of because it's, you know, it, it almost just kind of builds itself up in the filing cabinet in IVF clinics because, you know, you've got your patients, you know exactly what their problem was, you know exactly how hard they're trying to conceive. They're trying to conceive through IVF, so we don't get problems that we sometimes do in, you know, um, studies where people are trying to conceive through intercourse where we don't know how hard they're trying. Um, and we know if they're vaccinated or not because all of that's in the patient notes. And so with respect to female fertility, there's now... Uh, 11 studies that have been done in IVF settings and um, none of them show any difference in chance of conception between people who have been vaccinated and people who haven't been vaccinated um, and there are for males there are five studies in IVF settings and then there are two further studies among volunteer sperm donors um, and, and again showing no reduction in chance of conception uh, among uh, people having IVF. So obviously, uh, this is quite strong as a study design because you know really that people are trying to conceive really hard. You have really good data on their outcomes and on whether or not they were vaccinated. You might have some confounders, which some of the studies do control for. Um, but obviously, people quite often say, well, you know, I'm not having IVF. I'm trying to conceive through intercourse. So is this IVF data relevant to me? Um, and it maybe isn't necessarily, but I think what it does tell us biologically really strongly is that nothing on the path of like your ovaries working, um, producing eggs, producing good quality eggs, your endometrium, that's the lining of your uterus, being able to accept, be receptive to an embryo. None of any of those steps that all have to work to get an IVF pregnancy are less likely to work if you've been vaccinated. And um, I know that this is something that people sometimes worry about. Um, but it's definitely something that's been looked into a lot. And there's no evidence at all, even though we've looked really hard, that COVID vaccination reduces the chance that you'll get pregnant if that's what you want. May I chime in? R really quick though, I wanna ask oh. one quick question, then you may. Uh, I, I wanna go back to the pregnancy data. It, were, was, was all the nasty outcome with pregnancy during Omicron? Um, no, well, so some was. So we had, um, it, it's realized that um, outcomes in pregnancy have differed depending on what variant we're looking at. So from the point of view of pregnancy outcomes, Omicron and wild type are about equivalent. So if you're unvaccinated right now and you get pregnant it's, and, you, and you catch COVID, it's exactly like it would have been if you'd caught COVID at the very beginning of the pandemic. And, and I'll be honest, that wasn't good. We, we saw some really People, in, my, my colleagues in clinical practice saw some really dreadful things, mm -hmm. but it actually got worse uh, because in the alpha wave and then particularly in the delta wave, um, these variants were much more associated with the increased risk of stillbirth. So um, although uh, things are a little bit less bad now than they were in the delta wave, and that's partly because so many people are vaccinated, um, yes, we do have a difference in pregnancy outcomes depending on the variants, and the delta variant in particular was really bad for causing stillbirth yeah I, I i can't imagine omicron is anywhere near what uh, delta was i had delta myself it's nasty uh susan go ahead okay so about ivf mm. you say getting pregnant the vaccine has no effect but i had ivf and i gave birth to triplets and it was it was rather difficult to you know, stay pregnant. And, you know, I had to have a shot for 60 days. I had shots of progesterone and then I was on monitors. And then I was, you know, I had so much science going on. And my question is, you know, would you recommend to someone like me who would be probably not interested in a vaccine just because I didn't have any alcohol. I didn't smoke a cigarette. I, I, everything I did for my babies was, you know, I wanted to do right because I didn't want to feel guilty later for accidentally giving one of them, you know, some kind of disease or have a stillbirth or lose the pregnancy. But how, I mean, as a woman and also somebody who really had a long nine months, had three healthy babies, originally had four embryos taken, one didn't make it. How would you approach somebody like me and say, oh, it's okay, you can do it? I mean, I just am curious, like, with an in vitro insemination, 
pregnancy, it's it's a little different, you know, especially if you have multiples. Unfortunately, I had multiples. But um, how do you how do you see that? Yeah, that's definitely a good point. And I think you bring up two uh, really important points there. So one is that uh, how long ago did you have your babies? 30 years. Okay, so not really babies anymore. Um, <laughs> so so not, not in the pandemic. Um, one still important, my <laughs> they never stop being your babies, right? My babies are still my babies. They're not quite 30. Um, but one really important thing um, to know in the context of the pandemic was actually a lot of IVF clinics said, we really recommend that actually you wait until you're fully vaccinated before you start this course of IVF. And the reason that clinics often recommended that was because they knew that people in that position would be hesitant about getting vaccinated while they were pregnant. Even though we had a lot of reassuring data then, we had less than we do now, um, they knew that people feel that way and it's quite natural. So a lot of them recommended getting fully vaccinated before you started trying to conceive. And the other, or rather you started trying uh, your IVF cycles. And the other reason they recommended that is because uh, as we've mentioned, um, we know that uh, catching COVID reduces male fertility. And there was some evidence, I think probably we have decided now that it's not very good quality evidence and it's been overruled by other evidence um, that it could redu reduce female fertility. So that's another reason that they said, you know, you've got to get yourself in absolutely top condition before you start your IVF cycles. Um, so that's one aspect of, you know, how IVF was handled during the pandemic. But I do take your point, and I've spoken to so many people who were in the position that you were in, um, of having a pregnancy that for whatever reason is high risk, or maybe it's not high risk, maybe it just took you a really long time to get pregnant, or maybe it didn't even take you a really long time to get pregnant, you're just anxious. All of these things are, you know, such natural ways to feel. And in these conversations that I've had with people, um, what I've always emphasized, and what I actually emphasize with everyone, is that, you know, it's your body, it's your choice, it's a personal decision, and you just have to have all the information and be really comfortable with the decision that you've made. And a lot of the time when people hear about these risks of catching COVID, they sort of think to themselves, well, how would I feel if I caught COVID and then something bad happened when I could have protected myself? And they make the decision that they want to get vaccinated. And some people think about that and they think, well, you know, I'll be really careful. Um, my job means that I can work from home a lot. I'll wear masks when I'm out and about. And actually, you know, I would prefer to take my chances with COVID than the vaccine. Now, this isn't our official guidance. We wouldn't recommend it, but it's absolutely a personal choice. And I think it's really important that we um, respect people's, you know, autonomy in this. Um, and so that's really been yeah. how I've kind of approached these conversations when I've been having them with people. Um, you just have to, yeah. to get all the information and to make a decision that you feel comfortable with. And actually, quite a lot of the yeah, time, people is, make kind is... of halfway house decisions. Um, sorry, I'll just yeah. finish quickly. Where, where sometimes people are like, oh, I, I, I feel really nervous. Uh, I don't know if I want to get vaccinated. Um, and, and we talk about it a bit. And I say, well, the time it's riskiest to get COVID is after when you're about 28 weeks pregnant and, and you're about 10 weeks pregnant now. So maybe, you know, wait to have your scan, which in the UK we have at about 12 or 13 weeks. And if everything looks good on your scan, maybe you might feel comfortable then. Or wait until you've had your 20 week scan and you've seen um, that everything looks good. Maybe you might feel comfortable then. And actually a lot of people who early in their pregnancies were like, oh, I don't know, uh, ultimately went on to get vaccinated later in their pregnancies. But the important thing was, it was their choice based on all the information and based on what they felt comfortable with. Yeah, you're zeroing in on such a core issue here that it, that in this country, informed consent and patient choice was largely thrown out of the window for much of the pandemic. And I think the mandates are what created half of the resistance and the, and the, the concerns out there because people we're just told do it or you can't go to school, you can't go to college, you can't work, you can't go in a restaurant. And people uh, and doctors weren't even given a chance to give an informed consent because there was just a mandate. So uh, we, we used to call what you do just routine practice of medicine with informed consent. And all of a sudden that was all thrown out the window. 
So I, I appreciate so much that you bring that topic up. Um, it's interesting. I work with a, you know, I do a, a, another uh, stream with a, a doctor who's very, very, has very grave concerns about the vaccine. So when she sits with a patient, her informed consent would be different. Mine is sort of closer to yours, actually, as you know, and my, all my elderly patients are all vaccinated. I just have still, still reconciling my clinical impressions with what the data is showing and then you know what which data is right and is there any public pro problem with the publications i i've seen adulteration of of medical literature during this pandemic much to my amazement and so i'm just trying to be very very careful in getting to the truth i appreciate that you feel very confident in your position your data seems solid and i understand why you would feel the way you do but what i like most is that you bring up this this aspect of you present your data to your patient and the patient with you makes that decision that we used to just call that medicine. <laughs> it used to be just medical care, uh, and why that would be something that uh, is suddenly you know noteworthy is just an, we live in an incredible time. Uh, so, uh, wonder if you have any reaction to that. Well, I think that this differed a lot between countries. Um, there were lots of places that that didn't have mandates, um, and. I, I don't know exactly how it went down for you guys, but I hope that, you know, if we can meet anywhere, and I think we've met in a lot of places, we can meet in this space where yes, we agree that it's course, really important for people to know all of the information, the risks of COVID, yeah. the risks of vaccination, and the benefits of vaccination. Yeah. And they, and they make, make their really decision. That they can feel yeah. comfortable yeah. with. And I hope that by coming 100%. on tonight, I have opened up some of that information to people who might not have heard it before. But what I would like to say, because I see our time is running down, is that to anyone out yes, there who is pregnant, if you are, you know, sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know if I should, I would really recommend that you schedule time and have a discussion with your midwife or your doctor or whoever it is that's looking after you because you probably have individual concerns that all of this stuff I've talked about tonight doesn't necessarily address but your own medical practitioner will be able to address those medical concerns because they know you they know your whole medical history so anyone out there who's making this decision for themselves um, I really would recommend just having a chat with your midwife or doctor um, and hopefully you can come to one of these places where whatever decision yes. you make you feel really comfortable with it of course, of course, and thank you for saying that. Let, let me just get, let's get down some little, little more grass, brass tacky before I let you go. So if somebody's been fully vaccinated and boosted, and let's say that was a year ago, you're saying they should get uh, a bivalent boost before they get pregnant, during the pregnancy, or either? Uh, so I will, I actually had to, I looked up your guidance and then I checked with a real American obstetrician to check that I was reading your guidance right, because I knew you might ask me about your guidance. <laughs> Your guidance in America is um, basically that you have um, a kind of something that the CD con CDC considers as being up to date. And up to date right now would be having had your primary course, having had your first booster, booster and having had a bivalent booster. And if you're pregnant and you are up to date, you are good. You need nothing further. And if you're thinking of That's getting right. pregnant and you're not up to date, you can absolutely get yourself up to date before you get pregnant. That is completely fine on the USA guidance. If, however, you're already pregnant and you're not up to date, then the recommendation would be that you get up to date and getting up to date right now would mean getting a bivalent booster. Uh, unless you just had Omicron. <laughs> unless, unless you just you had, before you got pregnant. Yes, thank you for reminding <laughs> so, me. Unless you just have it, in which case the CDC says that you need to wait two months is your guidance before you get this. And then it's like, oh, it's, it just seems odd. It seems that's a very odd recommendation. Oh, but yeah. I, I, I think six months is better. Yeah, it's what it, I don't know. It's it's so interesting how medicine Can and, we just and make the boosters better and make but sure. Medicine obstetrics look at things a little differently. It's interesting. Now I know. I mean, so, I just. You just what? You're worried. I know. Everyone's worried. I'm worried about women not having a voice and and understanding their bodies well, and that they do have a voice dr Mel yeah. just said no i know it's my that, body my that, choice that's what and, she is saying. but see that's it's hard when you're being mandated and told and i you should, understand that's where a lot the, of this trouble's coming from and that's, the that's, obstetrician's office is like get your vaccine you gotta do it right. and they don't have the data it's only been three years like in 10 years i want to know 
if I need a vaccine. You know what there'll I mean? Lot, After we there'll do be the, more data. <laughs> there'll yeah, be more data, I need but, more data. But I, that's why I wanted Dr. Mayo to come in here. I thought she she is convinced of her data, and her data is solid. Um, I'm persuaded. I'm not quite quite there yet, but, but all the way, I still have questions here and there. Um, uh, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear. Every time something new comes out, you will find me tweeting yeah. about it. So um, right. as the day comes, yeah. you will and see. Yeah, and your 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 tweets are nice and clear. And is that again Vicky mailed FACS or something, or what is that? Vicky <laughs> loves FACS. <laughs> I, I I have lived to regret the handle that I chose. So um, FAX FACS it stands for flow assisted cell sorting. That's the laboratory technique that I cut my teeth on, and I love it. And so my handle, which I came up with when I was very junior scientist, is Vicky Loves Facts. It's my favorite laboratory technique. That is my handle. There it is. Um, it's too late to change yeah. it. So if you would like to follow me, that's where you can follow it's fine. me. It's all good. Thank you for uh, being one of those that's uh, willing to just... St I, I don't know that it takes courage to come in here, why it should take courage. <laughs> I don't understand no, that. I give her a lot of credit for so. showing up. I, yeah. I was very sure that you would give a fair hearing to the data that we used to make these recommendations yeah. and that you in uh, America with the ACOG have also used to make these recommendations. Um, and it was a pleasure talking to you. Very late here now, though. So um, I I'm think sorry. I will okay. <laughs> apologies, <laughs> but apologies, but gratitude that you came in. Thank you so much. And we'll hopefully talk someday soon. Take care. That is Dr. Our uh, producer needs to go take care of his baby. I know. He gives so. me a minute 37 to go. Uh, so, And his wife, by the way, was vaccinated when she was pregnant. Uh, and yeah, everything and turned, turned out, out fine, right? And right, he turned Caleb? out totally fine. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, He's yeah. fine. I, this was before we knew any any hesitation at all. This was right at the beginning of everything going on. Again, people need and, to make their decisions yeah. with their doctor on their own, not mandated by government or public right. health officials. That is a categorical That's that's got to be categorically. I told case. I told Caleb that he genetically married up. Yeah, oh, I definitely <laughs> so did. did. Oh, and, and she's hot. Definitely did. So yeah. did I. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, that's, that's, definitely married we, up. We have a, but I, I, I'd have to say something good. to be clear because people say this every time that I mention that I got the vaccine and my wife got the vaccine. She got it while she was pregnant. Yeah. We have not given any of those vaccines to the baby like since he was born. Mm. This was way yeah, back I still to the beginning don't understand. of the pandemic. I so, I, yeah. I, I, I don't understand the the aggression with which is being recommended for the kids. I understand if somebody's taking care of critically ill, you know, kids with alpha and delta particularly, but now it's Omicron. It's very rare to have for a healthy kid to have really serious trouble. We've heard a lot of concerns about vaccine injuries. I've seen a lot of vaccine injuries. I don't this think all hard. the women are reporting their menstrual cycles either. So well, yeah, and, and, I, you Naomi know, has different data. And I can honest I can honestly tell you, and I hate doing the anecdotal evidence in you know discussions mm, like this right. but i absolutely do know multiple people who are very pro vaccine very pro medicine have never questioned anything and have either children mm. or are themselves going through some severe neurological side effects that they don't want to mm -hmm. talk about publicly so there are a lot of people that aren't reporting it because they're just confused because they don't understand why something that they've trusted all of their lives is suddenly harming them but they don't also want to come out and appear to be anti-science. So they're stuck somewhere. So there's a lot I, of science. I have people seen plenty of people. I've seen a lot of people with clear cut vaccine injuries that have been mistreated, marginalized, pushed aside. P people don't want to talk about it, to deal with it. It's 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 very weird. It's very, very weird. Uh, and and again, as always, the truth is gonna be somewhere in the middle. I I <laughs> the fact that there were no vaccine injuries in the all that data that she presented to us is what makes me uncomfortable with the data because anybody that's given out hundreds of vaccines has seen injuries. And if there's tens of thousands, there's got to be vaccine injuries in there. And why wasn't that reported? And I guess it didn't affect the pregnancy, which is good news. But um, hmm, it, it's all it gets. It's still a bit confusing. But that that was very reassuring data that she did present, and it certainly pushes thing in a in a in a, a easier direction. And we could tell that she's also empathetic mm, to women. To... It didn't seem like it with all the data, but she's clearly you know she she understands that women yeah, yeah, have her passion, questions and into. worries and. You know, we're we're different. We have I mean, the men there are men out there that probably lost fertility, which is not good too, but um but the whole thing is just so disconcerting. If, if there was greater transparency about the people that have had the horrible reactions, I think people again, there is this belief that somehow by 
bringing things into the sunlight, you're somehow going to make people more resistant or make things worse. You're not. You make things worse by things being just on an anecdotal basis. And, you know, people hear horror stories. You don't have to hear too many of those or see too many of those without having grave, grave concerns. And if they just opened it up, talked about it, and it's complicated because Omicron is so much milder. It does hurt some people still, particularly older folk. It is a lot milder. There are vaccine injuries. The risk reward is it's an endemic. Less thing. It's endemic now, but again, like in, you know, flu is endemic, and so we get regular vaccines for that. Mm, it's uh, it's still. I, I feel a little better about pregnant women, uh, but I'm still concerned about young people and children. So there we are. So um, this is what. But he wasn't going to push back on her and yell at her. So if no, you guys say you weren't hard the only hard thing I apologize her. for, I was going to ask her about her funding sources, which she talked about in huge detail on Twitter. You can find it there. Right. Uh, and I apologize for not having asking that asked that question. Right. That's the one thing I forgot to do. Um, it's you know it's kind of like listening to a defense attorney defend a, a killer. No 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 you know, no. They no, like, no no no. It's you, not. That's Robert Kennedy. That that That's person, Robert Kennedy. Right. This is you, like listening to an expert witness. Right. Expert witnesses give good data. Sometimes that data is a reflective of an abject truth and sometimes it's uh, near the truth and so but we'll, i mean we'll it's see. her job that's what she does and mm -hmm. she's gonna do what she does all right listen uh somebody's will, gotta do it we will see you next monday gad sad in the house is that gonna be a usual time at three o'clock yeah three o'clock pacific time pacific Sasha Lop at Lop at Hope. and uh, again i'm gonna keep sorting through this stuff we're gonna keep listening to everybody i'm gonna try to get some opinions like uh, dr mail in here to give them a chance to present their present their data and it it I think it's right. I think it lines up well with the concern data as as well. You know, the things that we look at and go, oh, my God, is this, you know, should we be alarmed about this? It, it helps balance things out a little bit. So, Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, appreciate you all being here. Uh, and your comments were great. Sorry we didn't have time for calls. Susan was in on the, what's that, Very Caleb? grateful, very grateful to her for coming on. I, people don't understand. We've extended invitations to an, an endless list of experts and physicians and doctors and so far only two people have agreed and she was one of them so i'm very grateful for her yeah so and you're I, not I, called a right wing loon this yeah, week which yeah is, <laughs> which is bizarre as an independent and democrat <laughs> most know. of my life and, uh so i the, saw uh, that and i was like god oh, damn we got to get somebody but she was suggested to me on twitter well, by I, she somebody. was better than the other last one and maybe we can get another one in here to talk and about more Sharon. interesting i think yeah. people will actually watch this yeah it was good data it's good data and, and we'll share if you care everybody i'd like to see if um we can get a pediatrician in here that is very 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 pro vaccine and sort of get that data on the on the table too because mm. that's confusing to me and it's still so all right everybody we'll see you on monday with gad sad three o'clock pacific time Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. Like one time, there was one time when I was probably like 14 where I made a where I made a joke about my mom being attractive. And then all of you're the obsessed, thoughts that flood about it. Yeah. About like, what if today is the day I try to my mom <laughs> you know what i mean like the amount of times but, but, i've had but, to combat that thought the armada of compulsions i developed funny, over the, the years had the same thing it was just telling you know? me. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, really? yeah i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs>